Thanks very much for that, Lum. So we're going to start today's message with just a short excerpt from a, a video on Irish television, which was on a few years ago. Now, the host, which is now the late Gay Byrne, asks atheist comedian Stephen Fry a question. Now, some of you may, say, may have seen this, but we're just going to play this short um, clip and then we can get talking about Jesus and natural evil. Suppose what Oscar believed in as he died, in spite of your protestations, suppose it's all true, mm. and you walk up to the pearly gates and you are confronted by God. What will Stephen Fry say to him, her, or it? I will basically, what's known as theodicy, I think, I, I'll say bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I'd say. And you think you're going to get in? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he says, no. As the interview goes a little bit longer. I thought I'd cut that bit off there. But uh, he doesn't think that he'd get in as well. But it's very powerful. Bone cancer in children? What's all that about, God? It's very powerful. Because Stephen Fry here has tapped into something very upsetting. He's observed something which seems inconsistent. If there is a good and powerful God, why do the most vulnerable and suffer and die due to no fault of their own? Another atheist blogger concurred with Stephen Fry. He says, bone cancer in children does it for me. I'm fine with God punishing adults. By the time we reach adulthood, we've all done something evil in the eyes of the biblical God. But children? A two-month-old with bone cancer? No, sorry, but that small child has done nothing wrong. A God with the ability to stop bone cancer in children but doesn't is an evil God. And these atheists have then drawn the conclusion that God is either impotent, wicked or imaginary. And they've concluded that he's not there, that he's... Imagine, well, he's, that if he's there, he's wicked, but most likely that he's not there. So how do we respond to Stephen Fry? What, what do we say to him? What do we make of what we can describe as natural evil? Suffering which occurs in the natural world, independent of any human interaction or inf influence or intervention. Things like disease, bone cancer in children, tsunamis, floods or tornadoes. Well, this is what we're going to be reflecting on today as we consider Jesus versus natural evil. Today we're going to see Jesus encounter natural evil and see how he might respond to such suffering. And his response will help us think about natural evil in the world and how to respond to it. But let's first start with Stephen Fry's fierce question to God. Why is there bone cancer in ch children? And it's certainly a valid question. I can empathise with him and appreciate why he gets angry in the face of such blatant misery, suffering and injustice. Yet unfortunately, his criticism becomes empty when you consider the alternative. For Fry and other atheists actually offer no alternative. Atheism offers no meaningful explanation for suffering. For indeed, the very concept of meaning is absent in materialistic atheism. Now, lead, leading atheist Richard Dawkins perhaps unwittingly agrees. It's a long quote, but it's a very important one. The last bit's the most important part. Where he says, The total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent com contemplation. In a universe of blind physical forces and, and genetic rep replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason to it. Um, the universe we observe has precisely the properties, uh, sorry, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If at bottom there is no design, no, pur no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. To Dawkins, and I think this quote is entirely consistent with the atheist worldview, our universe does have no purpose, no grand design, no good, no evil, nothing 
but blind, pitiless indifference. Things just happen and that's it. Atheism offers no answer to the why questions. Things just are. So if Stephen Fry and Richard Dawkins are right and God is simply imaginary, when we suffer, when we feel pain, we can do whatever we want, but we just can't ask why. To the poor kid who has bone cancer, when that little pain, feeble voice on the operating table asks, Daddy, why do I have bone cancer? You just have to shrug your shoulders and just say, you're unlucky, kid. The atheistic universe offers nothing but blind, pitiless indifference to our disease, sickness, tsunamis, floods and pain. Atheism offers no answer to suffering. We just suffer and that's it. So why do we seek meaning amidst suffering? Why do we ask the why question? Why do we as humans, uniquely in the animal kingdom, seek to find a reason for our pain other than just meekly accepting our place as a helpless cog in this indifferent machine? Because at this point, atheistic materialism fails to account for our human experience. We do seek to find meaning. We don't just squeal and run like the animals. We want to know why. So I think atheism fails to account for, satisfactorily account for why we want to find meaning in a meaningless place. Materialistic atheism fails to satisfy at the level of our human experience. But it also fails at the rational level. For suffering, the presence of evil actually gives us an intellectual argument against naturalism and even for the existence of God. Now C.S. Lewis, the, the well-known author and, um, and, and um, of children's books and well-known writer, was once a committed atheist who admitted that he actually felt the force of the argument of suffering for atheism, for an imaginary God. He once believed, and he said this, Had God designed the world, it would not be a world so frail and faulty as we see. Yet Lewis recognised that this argument against God contained the seeds of its own subversion. Because he argued then, he says, as he reflected and thought about this, he said, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and uncruel, of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. Now, I'm not sure if you quite follow what's going on here. It's a subtle but a really important point. But if you want to say that something is evil, you must have some kind of referent, something to compare it to, the concept of a straight line. Now, in a blind, indifferent universe where there's just matter and energy, there is no concept of a straight line. There is no design. There just is. So if one clump of cells happens to be cancerous and causes a certain physical, painful physiological reaction, what does evolution care? What does DNA care? What does the universe care? It doesn't. There is nothing, no referent to say this is wrong. Nowhere where it's written, this is evil, there is no design, no evil, no good, just nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Yet we do say that suffering is wrong. Our Premier, Daniel Andrews, described the coronavirus as a wicked enemy. Our human experience is one which mourns suffering and considers suffering an intrusion, an enemy. When a friend or a child is taken too soon, we feel that it's just not right. It's wrong. But as soon as we start saying something's wrong, something is evil, then atheism has the problem. Where does that good referent, the idea of the straight line, come from? Because if atheism is true, then nothing is objectively wrong. As soon as we say something's evil, then atheism is undermined. And this issue becomes acute when you consider bone cancer in children. Atheists shouldn't have a problem with bone cancer in children, should they? Because atheism doesn't solve the problem of evil or cancer in children. Because with atheism, there's just no problem to solve. There just is. Some people get lucky and other kids get bone cancer. And that's just how it is. So rather than the problem of evil showing that God can't exist, it actually demonstrates precisely the opposite. That atheism is false and that there is a God. This was a powerful argument for C.S. Lewis 
And it's, it's a substantial challenge to the intellectual foundations of Stephen Fry's objection against God. But atheism still has a further problem. If we step back and say, okay, God, all this suffering makes you an ad imaginary, it doesn't actually help the situation, does it? You're no better off. Atheism doesn't alter or alleviate the suffering. Bone cancer is still there. There's still suffering in the wake of tsunamis, floods, fires, and storms. Removing God doesn't really improve anything. It just removes someone to blame. So what about God then? If God is real, how could a good God give bone cancer to children? Well, remember the goal of this series, Jesus versus suffering, because we're examining how Jesus responds to evil and suffering. Because the best way to know about God is if he reveals himself. And God has revealed himself most comprehensively through the person and works of Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at how Jesus responds to the problem of evil. And we're going to ask him our hard questions about natural evil. So Jesus, bone cancer in children? What's all that about? And Jesus engages these difficult questions in Mark, sorry, in the gospel, chapter 8 of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus has just finished teaching the greatest sermon of all time, the Sermon on the Mount, which has left the gathered crowd amazed. And then we learn what happened in the next two verses in chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. When Jesus came down the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him. Here Jesus is confronted with natural evil, isn't he? A man with leprosy. Evil and suffering which has nothing to do with the actions of humans. It's not his fault. So we could ask Jesus the same question as Stephen Fry. Leprosy? What's that about, God? Yet there's no explicit reason given for this man's suffering. It's just there. It's not because of karma. It's not because he's made some bad decisions in life or in a previous life. It's not because he's being punished. This passage makes no attempt to explore why is he like this. It's just acknowledging the reality of the world that we have. Whether this is the best of all possible worlds, there's no philosophical reflection. Suffering is the reality of the world in which Jesus enters and encounters. He enters a world with evil and suffering and he, he's confronted by things like bone cancer and leprosy. So how does Jesus respond? Well, he's not surprised or confounded by it. In fact, he allows this man to approach him and ask a question. And he asks the question, Lord, if you are willing... You can make me clean. Isn't this Stephen Fry's question? Isn't this the problem of evil? A loving God would want to eliminate evil. Lord, if you are willing. And a loving God has the power to eliminate evil. You can make me clean. And this leper here highlights the two issues at the heart of this problem. In his very simple question. It's almost as if he's pondered the problem of evil in his own life. Are you able? Are you willing? It's interesting that this leper assumes Jesus' power, yet questions Jesus' goodness. I wonder if this is because this is the natural response to God in the face of suffering. Now, C.S. Lewis explored this question in a Grief Observe, which is writings that he penned in the days after the death of his wife. You can feel the raw emotion and pain in his words as he cries out, saying, What reason have we except for our own desperate wishes to believe that God is good? Doesn't all the prima facie evidence suggest exactly the opposite? Hence the leper's question, So Jesus, so God, are you willing to make me clean? Are you good? And then we look there in the next verse. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. And here the problem of evil becomes problematic. Jesus says, I am willing. Jesus does have the power to overcome suffering. But he also has the desire. He willingly heals. 
Again, it's almost as if Matthew is acutely aware of the philosophical problem of evil. Is Jesus able to alleviate this man's suffering? Is Jesus willing to alleviate this man's suffering? And the answer to both is yes. So what does this mean? Notice that Jesus, the God-man, doesn't just disappear in a puff of philosophical logic. The philosophical response must be that God has a reason for permitting or allowing suffering. It's far too simple to say that the presence of evil renders God impotent, wicked or imaginary. For here in Matthew's Gospel we see God in Jesus confronted with suffering. In fact, the very problem of evil. And he responds by using his great power and his great love to cure and heal the leper. And so here we see both the goodness and the power of Jesus. And so then how should we respond? Well, Matthew has provided an answer in the very next episode he records for us in Mark, Matthew chapter 8. See there in verse 5, uh, we see when Jesus had entered a Capernaum, a centurion came to him. A Roman centurion approaches Jesus. Now, that's not a photo. That's just a, uh, just to make it clear, that's not an actual photo of the centurion who approached Jesus. This is a, a sort of a rendition of what a centurion might have looked like. But you see, centurions had no pre-existing reasons to believe in the Jewish God. He would have been, the, the centurion would have most likely been a Roman, pagan, polytheist. The Romans were the occupiers, superior and dominant. So hence, the gods of Rome were obviously more powerful and more favourable compared to the puny God of Israel. So here was the centurion, it was a man in charge of other Roman soldiers, a commander, a leader, a man who asked nobody for help. So this is why verse 5 is so stunning and surprising. Because a centurion came to him, to Jesus, asking for help. In Jesus, the centurion saw something. He saw something that his own gods couldn't resolve. And the shock and astonishment continues as in verse 6 where the Roman centurion addresses a penniless Galilean preacher as Lord. My Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralysed, suffering terribly. A Roman centurion servant was suffering terribly from some natural evil, some affliction which paralysed him. Yet he comes to Jesus and confronts Jesus with his servants suffering by addressing him as Lord. And again, cultural familiarity has dulled how incredible it is that a centurion would approach Jesus and address him in this way. So imagine, just to give us an example of how, this, how, how remarkable this is, imagine it's 1942 and it's the Second World War. German armies dominate Europe. In fact, Germany occupies everything with supreme power. All the world's riches are in German hands. And imagine a Nazi general of Norway, which is, this is a picture of Nazis in, in, in Norway, which is some remote outpost of the German territory. Imagine one of these generals approaching a poor homeless street preacher about a sick soldier that he has under his command and addresses him as Mein Führer. Because Rome and its riches and its power offered no solution to his servant's suffering. The Roman doctors offered no solution to his servant's suffering. The Roman emperor offered no solution to the centurion servant's suffering. The Roman gods offered no solution to his servant's terrible suffering. Atheism offers no solution to his terrible suffering. He seeks Jesus. But why? Notice that the centurion questions neither Jesus' willingness nor his power to heal. See there in verse 8, he recognises the authority of Jesus. A centurion recognised authority when he sees it. He recognised the authority and power of Jesus that in just a word, Jesus could heal him. And the response when coming to face to face with God was trust. To trust the one with authority. Trust your life to him and trust your reputation as this centurion did to him. The centurion trusted himself to Jesus of Nazareth, which was an insult, not only to the pantheon of Roman gods and the supposed authority and the glory of Rome, but it was also an insult to the Jews, the people of God, because they should have been the ones recognising Jesus for who he was. But a Roman centurion recognised and trusted the prophet that they, the Jewish people, were supposed to be looking for. 
So much so that even Jesus is amazed. In verse 10, he hadn't seen such great faith in Israel. A man who saw the power and the goodness of God and trusts him. And this is the right response to God. Rather than shake a fist at God like Stephen Fry, this pagan centurion sees Jesus as the solution to the world's greatest problems and the solution to his immediate problem of his servant's suffering. And his trust was well placed because in Matthew 18, 8, 13, Jesus says to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Remarkably, the servant is healed from a distance, demonstrating precisely the power in Jesus that the centurion had recognized and trusted. So there seems to be great irony in the criticisms of God by people like Stephen Fry. They seem to be saying, there is no God and I hate him. Yet the response of the centurion is vastly different, one of utmost respect and trust. When you meet God face to face, your response to him may be different. The centurion embodies the response that Jesus is worth trusting amidst suffering. But then a natural question then emerges. Well, if Jesus is powerful and good, why doesn't he just heal everyone? Well, after this, Jesus confronts yet more natural evil by healing the fever and the Apostle Peter's mother-in-law. And then we see in verse 16 that Jesus does indeed heal everyone. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed and brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. Everyone who comes to see him personally at that location and at that time were healed. He demonstrates again that he is simultaneously all-powerful and all-loving. Yet supposing that Jesus should just wave a wand and heal all afflicted people everywhere misunderstands the purpose for why he came and for why he heals. Because Jesus came to bring the kingdom of heaven, the reigning presence of God. It's a kingdom where, where God rules. It's where the, there is healing and wholeness and unmediated, unsullied relationship with him. And Jesus is the king. And then notice in verse 17, Jesus' healings point to his identity. He is the one who is promised to bring this kingdom. He healed all the sick in order to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Thus, through these healings, he demonstrates that he fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah, a prophecy of a great anointed one who was to come. Jesus doesn't heal simply to solve the philosophical problem of evil or to show himself as a kind, benevolent miracle worker. He does it to reveal himself as the one prophesied about and to also show a glimpse of the kind of the kingdom that he would rule. We see a glimpse of a kingdom where suffering is no more and where we see Jesus as the Messiah, the chosen one of God. It's an exciting vision for life that even a pagan Roman centurion can recognize. And this is the response and the response to this Messiah, this king of this new centurion. So, the response to the Messiah, this king of this new kingdom, like the centurion, is to trust him. So what does it mean then to trust Jesus amidst our difficulty? Well, our context is slightly different. Jesus isn't with us in the same way now. We, we can trust Jesus to heal, but given his greater purpose is to reveal the kingdom of God, we have to wait until the full revelation of that kingdom before we can expect healing now. Yet we can still entrust ourselves to Jesus amidst our sufferings and sickness and illness now. Now, a number of years ago on the podcast and radio show I ran for many years called Bigger Questions, I interviewed a woman named Michelle who shared about the many difficulties and hardships that she'd encountered in her life. Her brother died in a sudden car accident returning from his honeymoon when he was just 22. She'd tried unsuccessfully to have children with IVF for seven years. She had a kidney disease which required dialysis every day. She had a donated kidney from her husband, but it failed, and she faced many challenges and hardships. 
So given all this, I asked her in the interview, why did you believe in God? And she answered by saying, I would not survive if I did not believe in God. God has kept me. God has helped me. God has protected me. God loves me. He's good to me. I still feel the love of God, the peace of God. He is my guardian and protector. If he wasn't there, I honestly don't think that I'd be alive. And I certainly wouldn't be happy. Amidst all of her sufferings and difficulties, even though she'd hadn't, even though some of them hadn't even been removed, she trusted in Jesus. She endured her sufferings with Jesus alongside her, and he had not disappointed her. Even though her suffering hadn't been relieved in the same way that Jesus healed the leper, the centurion's servant, all, all those we've read about in Matthew today. But Michelle could trust Jesus with her suffering, and she would await the coming kingdom. And interestingly, sometime after the interview, she actually did get a new kidney transplant, which has been working, which means she doesn't need dialysis anymore. So perhaps Jesus is still powerful and good today. So then how do we answer Stephen Fry? Well, I think he asked the right question. It's a hard one. But unfortunately, our culture fails to offer any convincing explanation nor answer to suffering. I think atheism makes the suffering, particularly of young children, more bleak, more despairing and more hopeless. A friend from school once shared a message on Facebook which came in response to her battle with cancer. And I think it typifies our collective thinking, our culture's collective thinking about suffering. She said, life is short, follow your bliss with abandon, love those in your circle without fear or hesitation, tomorrow isn't promised, all we have is now. That's it. That's the way to respond to suffering. Tomorrow isn't promised. Today could be your last day. All we have is now and then nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. It may sound nice, but it's actually quite shallow. Or there's Jesus, the one with great power who entered our broken world and offered love and goodness and hope. He is the one who can reach to us in our brokenness and despair and offer hope to each one of us, either now or most certainly in the future where the kingdom is revealed in its fullness. And we can trust the one who says to us, I am willing be clean. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus who confronts this evil in the world and who overcomes it by his power and his goodness. Please help us to trust him amidst our own suffering and challenges in this world as we long for the future world where there is no pain, suffering and difficulty, uh, where Jesus is the Messiah, the King of all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final song today is written... Take a seat. Let's close with the words from Isaiah 53, 4-5, which was quoted in Matthew. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Let's pray. Father, let us go from here empowered by your spirit to all things for you and your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and look forward to seeing you all next week as we consider Jesus versus the agents of evil, as we consider, continue, continue our reflection on Jesus and the problem of evil and suffering. But please say hello to someone perhaps you don't know and have a great week. We'll see you next week.